Welcome to Bridges Community Church. Thanks for joining us. Whether you're with us here on campus, outside on our patio, inside our worship center, or whether you're joining us online, we are glad you are here. Our services will begin in just a few moments, but before we start, we'd like to tell you about some of the things happening around our church. Bridges family. In just a few weeks, we will be hosting Family Fun Night here on our campus. For those of you who don't know what Family Fun Night is, it is a community outreach that we've been doing here at Bridges for many, many years. I hope you've already marked your calendars for October 29th at 5.30 p.m. That's when we will be hosting our free Trick Car Treat drive through event here on our campus. Now I know you're wondering how you can be involved in Family Fun Night, so here's the scoop. You can invite your friends and neighbors to come on the 29th and enjoy our drive through event. You can donate candy. We need like 30 pounds per vehicle, so that's a lot of candy. And here's the most fun part. You can sign up to decorate and host a car here at Family Fun Night and just hand out candy to all our visitors. And here's the one that's the most fun. You can sign up and decorate your car and hand out candy to all of our visitors. We may even give a prize to the car that's decorated the most. I look forward to serving with all of you. Please don't miss out on what God is going to do in and through us at Family Fun Night. Go to bridges.info to sign up today.
Well, hey, everybody, we have a real treat. I'm just delighted to have Rich and Sue Lackey uh, here on this conversation. They're coming to us from the UK. They are celebrating and a really, really incredible milestone. And Rich and Sue, we're so excited. You guys are celebrating 40 years of ministry um, on the mission field. You, you were sent out in 1981, 40 years later, here you are. And you guys haven't aged at all. Uh, but 40 <laughs> years, and for those who don't know, Bridges Community Church used to be First Baptist Church of Los Altos. You guys, we were the first church that you all used as a sort of a supporting church. So for the last 40 years, there's been this partnership. So we just are delighted. We wish we could see it in person so we could give you a hug and throw some streamers and confetti your way, but we are delighted. And just even before this recording, Rich, you were sharing how you used to be on staff at the church. You had been in the high school group. You attended Gunn High School. You were an intern. You went to Bio. I just, lo I love all of these connections. So for our young people watching this, this could be you one of these days. Now, don't let that scare you, but it's really just super exciting. So welcome, you guys. We just celebrate you. Thank um, you. Tell us, like, can you summarize uh, for those who don't know you, what it is that you do and uh, have been doing for the last 40 years and how you're connected to pioneers and all that kind of stuff? You can do the history part. Oh, his, well, well, what we've, what we've been what we, well um, when we first went out in 1981, we kind of anticipated, we planned, we thought the Lord was leading us to go to Morocco. Um, so we went to France and started to study French with the idea of going to um, then to Morocco to study Arabic. But within a year, we were asked to um, join the media ministry in Marseille, France, um, on a temporary basis. And then we could carry on with our studies and go to North Africa. Well, here we are 40 years later, and we're still with the media work. Um, but not even in France anymore. We've never lived in uh, North Africa, but we're now living in the UK, and we're still involved in a um, in a very very important ministry in media. And media has evolved, of course, over the years. When we started getting in, uh, being involved, uh, we went to work on the literature ministry. So they they were actually printing things and sending it to people in the post with a stamp on it <laughs> and and uh, and doing radio broadcasts and of course things have evolved over the years so we've been involved in in uh, video production and then satellite television and so forth and then and desktop publishing desktop publishing the whole evolution along the way um, until uh, 2006 we made the not we the media department made the decision to to go all in on internet. We had started a website in 1990 something, um, but we decided that the way ahead was going to be through uh, delivery over the internet. And so we, we went in and uh, so instead of producing programs for satellite television, that might've been 30 mm -hmm. minutes long or 25, we produced short clips that could be used uh, on the internet. And so you all are specifically, in terms of spiritual seekers, you're primarily focused on the Arab world, like you're primarily yes. focused on Muslims who are seeking, maybe they don't even know what they're seeking, but they, through the website, are able to interact with one or more believers who are able to then take next steps with them mm -hmm. in their spiritual journey, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and the ministry has broadened. Uh, can you tell us a story or two from either recent days or even just over the course of your ministry time that have really stood out to you? Yeah. Um, just yesterday, uh, we have a, a daily prayer time um, with our team here in the UK. And um, each day we pray for seekers or believers from different countries. So yesterday we were praying for um, people in the Levant. So that would be Syria, um, Palestine, uh, Israel. And there was a, um, a person who we prayed for 
And the story was quite simple. He, re- he had a dream of Christ. Yes. And he recognized who Christ was. And he searched the internet and he found our website. And the first thing almost that he said to the person that he was corresponding with was, I've seen Jesus. How do I become a Christian? I mean, and that happens um, actually quite often. The other thing that we prayed for someone else yesterday, the same, you know, in the same prayer time, he had come to the website basically to argue. And he started to engage with one of our responders. And he began by putting up all the reasons why Christianity was wrong and why Christ wasn't God and all these things that they do. But in recent months, he actually turned his life over and became a Christian. He accepted Christ and he's been baptized. Okay. So we're seeing this happen. Um, and it's it's yeah. not the odd occasion. I and mean, we're seeing it happening regularly. Yeah, daily. Thankful. Well, for those who are interested in following up more, come chat with me and we'll put you in touch with the lackeys. I know that they'd be delighted to add more to their prayer chain and to their newsletters. So thank you both for your time. Thank Thank you, you. Steve. Lord bless you.
preparation for our sermon, a very short section from the book of John that you all know well. When he had gone out, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Uh, Beth and I have had the privilege over the last few years to walk with a number of young adults through premarital counseling. Um, at some point along the way, one of the engaged couples asked, um, uh, when they asked me to do their premarital counseling, they were like, can we do it with Beth and you? Um, and I'm like, that's a good idea. We should always do that. Uh, and so then I think any time that I... Um, ever gave somebody the option, they always chose, uh, let's do it with Beth and you. So um, we work through some material, we tell them about our experiences in marriage, and we do our best to prepare them for life together, right? One of the topics that we always cover is love languages. Um, we, don't, we don't actually use Gary Chapman's book, although I recommend it, The Five Love Languages. Mostly we don't use it because they've already read it, um, but we use the concept because we believe the concept of the five love languages um, is very useful to help them identify what makes them feel loved, what makes their spouse feel loved or their future spouse, um, and just as important, what doesn't make their future spouse feel loved. So if you aren't familiar with the five love languages by Gary Chapman, here's the crash course. Chapman said, um, there are five ways to express love to the person you are with, which are words of affirmation, many of you know this, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, and receiving gifts. So words of affirmation, um, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, and receiving gifts. And he said people will naturally express their love in one or two of those ways, and people will naturally feel loved in one or two of those ways. So for instance, your spouse might not really care about receiving gifts. So you could come home with a gift every day, but it wouldn't really make your spouse feel loved. And that would be kind of wasted effort on your part uh, because it doesn't really move the needle for your spouse, right? Instead of gifts, your spouse might feel um, that they need quality time with you in order to feel loved. And if that's the case, then you can forget about the gifts, right? Save some money um, and double down on the time that you spend together. And if you do, you'll have a much happier spouse. See why you need to know this information before you get married? Um, you don't want to shoot for the wrong target in your marriage, because if you do, your spouse is going to feel neglected. Even if you are putting in a lot of work, you have to put in like the right kind of work, right? Love languages are helpful because they take the abstract concept of love your spouse and they make it more concrete, right? Because most spouses know they're not like surprised when you say you're supposed to love one another. They're like, oh, I've never heard that, right? But they're like, okay, but what does it actually mean practically to love another person? How do you know if you've done it? How do you know if you've failed? So simply instructing people, hey, you ought to love one another, that's just, it's too vague, right? It's too abstract. So a husband might think he's doing a good job loving his wife um, if he thought about her 10 times during the day. Um, and like felt all warm in his heart, right? Didn't call her, didn't spend any time with her, didn't praise her for anything, uh, but he thought about her, right? And he felt warm in his heart, so he thinks like, I'm doing great. I can check loving my wife off my to-do list for today, right? And that's just probably not gonna work, right? For those of us who have been married for more than five minutes. So Beth and I have found uh, with couples that we counsel, and really for our own like personal application in our own marriage, we need some very tangible directions on what it means to love one another. What does it actually look like? So here's the question for us today. When Jesus told his followers this new command that Al just read, um, to love one another, what did he mean? 
If we just think about each other 10 times a day, does that cut it? If we have warm feelings, does that cut it? Um, If we aren't mean to each other, you know, we didn't do anything proactively mean. We just didn't say anything. Is that enough? Are we loving one another then? Like, probably not, right? We probably need to actually do something else. But what? And how do you know if you have loved one another? And how do you know if you have failed at it? Well, the writers of the New Testament really flesh that out for us. It's like Jesus' earliest followers took his new command, love one another, and they applied it to all the different possible relationships that they could think of, husband and wife, parent and child, widow, orphan. They look at every kind of relationship, and it says what each one of them, uh, what it means for each one of them to love one another. And to the point of our series, which we're in, um, they made it very specific how church members are supposed to act toward other church members. Generically, those instructions on how church members are supposed to treat other church members are called one another commands. Encourage one another, greet one another, uh, forgive one another, confess your sins to one another, admonish one another. There's about 50 of them in the New Testament, depending on how you count. Like how many of them are synonyms of each other talking about the same thing, and how many of them are really unique. Today, we're going to look at three categories of one another commands, and then the basis for our one anothering. That's today. Then the next couple of weeks, we'll cover even more of the one another commands. So for the next few weeks, really what we're doing um, is not a like topical study. It's a deep exposition of Jesus' command to love one another, which again is exactly what the New Testament authors did. It's much of what the epistles are, these letters that the New Testament uh, leaders wrote to each other. It's just an expansion on Jesus' one command of love one another. And again, that's helpful for the same reason that love languages are helpful, because love one another is just too abstract, and we don't want any ambiguity around what we should do. We want to know exactly what we should do in order to properly love one another. So here we go, three one another's, or three categories of one anothering, and then the basis for our one anothering. Uh, First up, uh, one another number one, uh, greeting or greet one another. Paul actually commands to, for us to greet one another four times in the New Testament. Romans 16, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, 2 Corinthians uh, 13, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 26. And the full sentence of his command is, is actually greet one another with a holy kiss. Um, so we're commanded to kiss one another. Probably never heard that in church before. Um, not really. That's not really uh, the application there. Don't worry. We will not start enforcing that command when COVID's over. And if you really want to submit a sermon question about the meaning of holy kiss, go ahead. Okay? I'd love to get that question. But briefly, um, it is greet one another in a way that conveys warmth and meaningful affection. Right? It's not, I'm going to roll my eyes when somebody walks in the door. It's not, I'm going to say nothing. It's, I'm going to be proactive and greet you like I actually really care about you. It's how we would greet someone who that we're really excited to see. And as Christians, that's how we're supposed to greet everyone in the church which I know is hard for some of us, right? Some of us have so much social anxiety that we feel really awkward saying hello uh, to anyone, and especially to those that we don't know super well. Um, and we're like, I, 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 can't, um, I can't be that person who uh, welcomes other warmly um, because I, I, like, I hardly even know them, right? I can't, I can't do that. Um, but this actually isn't optional. Right? It's a command. And if we're really shy, then like, sure, let's try to help each other with that. But you can't just bail on something that's listed four times in the New Testament, right? It's a big deal. Welcoming others is a big deal. There's a reason God instructs us to greet others. And if we don't obey the greet one another command, just as would be the case with any other sin that God tells us about, if we don't greet others, we will hurt others and ourselves. Um, So here's what we found in our young professional group when we started talking about all this relationship stuff uh, several years ago. Um, If one of us showed up at YoPros 
at a Yopro gathering and walked in the door and other people were already there. Um, do the people who are already there, do they stop what they're doing and say hello to the person who just walked in the door? Or do they just keep talking amongst themselves and kind of ignore the person who just walked in? Which do they do? And if they just keep talking and don't greet the person, eventually, over time, the person who walks in begins to wonder, does it really matter if I even show up? Like, would anyone even notice if I wasn't here? They feel kind of invisible, especially if it's week after week after week after week, right? I come in, no one says anything. I walk up to two people who are already talking, and they just keep talking without turning to greet me. Like, hello, am I here? Do I exist? See, we hurt other people. We hurt them, especially over time if we are not greeting them. So what we started doing in Yopros, and then we'd call each other out on this just to make sure it happened, but when someone walked in, we would, as a group, stop our conversation for two seconds, turn and say, hi, whatever your name is, good to see you, and then go back to the conversation. Right? And I'll tell you, if everyone stops the conversation for two seconds and says, glad you're here, you really do feel important. Um, as long as they don't like, keep staring at you afterwards, right? Like, uh, I mean, after they say hi, they just expect you to start talking. That would be weird. Let's, you don't want to put the person on the spot, I understand. But we acknowledge your presence, affirm that you are here. It shows the person that he or she is valued. And it's one way in which we love one another. And if we fail at that, then we fail at loving one another. And we'll hurt others. Okay, one another, number two. Appreciation and encouragement. We'll talk about appreciation and encouragement together. Gary Chapman puts them together, right? He calls it words of affirmation. So we can put them together too. Um, it's recognition, thanks for what someone has done, applauding them, cheering them on, right? The opposite of appreciation and encouragement is criticism. Talk more about criticism in a minute. But Paul showers others with appreciation. He writes to different churches, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering in you in my prayers. Has anybody ever told you that? That would feel pretty good, wouldn't it? Um, or I thank God in all my remembrance of you, right? I mean, he is really laying it on thick, right? It's excessive. It's, he's lavish with praise and thanksgiving. And we might think, oh, that's just Paul. He's some big softy. I don't think he was. But he's, he's, he's doing more than that because he commands that we do the same thing. He, he, Paul instructs Timothy to have thanksgiving for all people, 1 Timothy 2.1. Then Paul commands the Thessalonian church, encourage one another and build one another up, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. And since these are commands, I'd really like for us to check ourselves here. Have we expressed thanksgiving for every single person that we know? Are we encouraging of one another? And if we're failing at that, then we're failing in one aspect of loving one another and it is sinful. Our survey results, if you guys haven't been here the last couple of weeks, I've given you several surveys. The first week we found out about a third of our people don't feel like they belong here. Two thirds do, praise God, about a third don't. And like that, um, this week, we, we have about a third of the people um, who say that they don't feel encouraged or thanked or appreciated, about a third of them. Um, now, some people are totally encouraged by our church. They circled the six on the survey, like my need for encouragement and appreciation is 100% filled. But other people circled all the way down on the one. And then there's about, you know, and then there's a bunch in between. So it's, it's, there's about a third of our people who are on the side of the scale where they don't feel encouraged, thanked, or welcomed, as we talked about last week. That's a, that's a third of our people. That's a problem. That means, as a church, we are, we are failing to love about a third of the people, and we are commanded to love them. Now, I know uh, at least part of your pushback, you're like, well, we can't be encouraging all the time, right? Sometimes we need to correct others. We need to offer critical feedback. We can't, we can't thank somebody for doing a great job if they did a terrible job, right? Like, that would be lying, pastor. You want us to lie? Okay, I'll go lie. No, that's, you're right. Okay, um, 
what are we supposed to do then? Um, a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the dynamic of uh, accountability, which is another one another command. Um, and so absolutely, there's a place for correction, and we're going to talk about that, and that is necessary. But for now, I, I want us to think about what do we do more? Do we offer more thanksgiving and encouragement or more criticism and correction? Um, especially for the engineers out there. You really have to watch this, okay? Um, your brain naturally wants to solve problems. Um, and praise God for that, right? We need problem solvers. We need you. Um, and I, I, I understand uh, why it's natural for you to want to solve problems. I come from a family of engineers, right? My dad, literally a PhD missile scientist. Um, and I think some of that is in me too, not the smart part, but the problem solving part. Um, it's like the default of my brain, right? I, I get it. You see something wrong, you want to go fix it, which is great, right? We need things fixed. The downside of that is if you are predisposed to naturally see problems, then your speech will be predisposed toward criticism and correction, not thanksgiving and encouragement. And you're going to need to work harder on the thanksgiving and encouragement. Like when my dad used to watch me play basketball, right? And I'll use my dad as an example instead of what I've seen in our congregation so as not to make anyone feel too much on the hot seat uh, this morning. But I've seen the same kind of things here, right? I'd come off the court from playing basketball and I wouldn't hear anything about the 20 points or 20 rebounds, right? I would hear about my form in boxing out. I'd hear about the time I missed the pass to the open guy, which on some level, I need to hear that, right? I'm sure my form should have been better, and I should have seen the open guy, sure, right? But over time, when there's more correction than praise, it's crushing. We all need way more praise and thanks and encouragement than we need correction. Uh, research done by John Gottman found the number one predictor in whether uh, couples stay married is the ratio of praise to criticism that they give each other. And he found the optimal ratio was five positive comments for every one negative comment. Those were the best couples, five to one, five to one, five to one praise to criticism. And he found on average divorced couples used four negative com uh, comments for every three positive comments. So really just, I mean, it's just slightly more negative to positive. It's about even, right? Four to three, that's about even. It's not like it was all negative. It, it only took a touch more negative than positive to tip the scales and you're divorced. But the happy going great couples were heavily weighted on the encouragement side. So us as a church, I, I, I want you to do this math in your head uh, anytime before we offer our constructive criticism to someone else in the church, especially. Before you say your critical comment, have you already offered five pieces of thanks and encouragement? Have you already built them up five times as much? And if not, then don't send the email, right? Don't send your critical email to the church staff unless you've already encouraged them five times. Don't make the comment to the person in your life group. Don't say, why do we have this kind of coffee instead of that kind of coffee, right? Just don't do it. Anything that's critical, um, don't do it. Um, one other point here to hopefully preempt another error, um, because I know what some of you are thinking, right? Um, you're thinking, okay, the next time I need to correct someone, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to run through five positive comments real quick um, and then get to what I need to say. Like, hey, uh, thanks for one, two, three, four, and I like your hair. Now, uh, let's talk about the issue that we really need to talk about. Right? People pick up on that, right? It's disingenuous. You really need to be truly thankful and express that. You need to spend way more time on thanks and genuine thanks before ever making corrections. Okay? And listen, I'm not unrealistic here. I know it's not a foolproof way to make somebody else feel encouraged. There are times we bend over backwards to make somebody feel encouraged, but they still feel crushed. Like you spend an hour building them up and five minutes on this needs to change, but the only thing they heard was this needs to change, right? That can happen, of course. But the question is, 
Are we spending the time? Are we bending over backwards? Or do we just cut straight to the criticism? And if we're not spending that time, we are failing to love one another. And again, it is sinful. If that describes us, we need to ask others for forgiveness. We need to ask God for forgiveness, for failing to love as we should. Okay, one another, number three, um, attention and empathy. Paul commands in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Um, And he tells the Corinthians church in 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 25, um, so that there should be no division among church members. Um, Each one should have equal concern for everyone else, right? If like if one part suffers, all suffer. If one is honored, all rejoice. The idea is whatever is going on with you is going on with me because I care about you. You really matter to me. So I feel what you feel. That's the command. Feel what others feel. Um, Once again, those of us who are kind of math and science wired, this might be a bigger challenge. Um, If we are more naturally task oriented than relationship oriented, um, the idea of connecting with somebody else's feelings, that's going to take extra work. But if we don't empathize, we will hurt others. Even if we don't mean to, we will hurt them. And it's sin. So one example, uh, again, from my dad, um, not to throw him under the bus, him and I reconciled long before he passed away, praise God. Um, and, but mainly, I just don't want to put any of y'all on the real hot seat. Uh, but again, I've seen similar kind of things here. When I was 18, I think I was 18, my parents and I were going to go visit colleges uh, one weekend. Dad was going to get home uh, from work early on a Friday, and then the three of us were going to hit out. The problem was earlier on the day, on Friday, mom was at the hair salon um, and she fainted. Um, that, she'd never fainted before in her life. So her friends at the hair salon, of course, they called the ambulance, right? The EMTs came, they checked mom out. They thought she was okay. They thought it was because of some medication that she was taking, but they didn't want her to drive home. Makes sense. Um, they wanted her to rest for the rest of the day. They actually called me at school and they called dad at work uh, to see if we could come get her. But neither of us could leave right then, so one of her friends took her home. All right, so later that afternoon, um, really when we're supposed to be leaving for the trip, I'm at home with mom in the living room and we're having a conversation. I'm like, mom, I don't think we should go on this college trip or I can just drive myself, like it's fine. And she's like, no, I really wanna go course, because she's mom, right? So we're having this conversation. Mom's laying on the couch. Dad comes home, comes into the living room. She's like laying on the couch with a washcloth on her head kind of thing, right? Um, Dad comes in. Mom's laying there. Dad's first words, he walks in the door. um, And like she'd fainted earlier in the day, been checked out by EMTs. Dad's first words are, is the car all packed up and ready to go? (sighs) Didn't say hello, right? Just is the car packed, like zero awareness uh, for how mom might be feeling in this moment, just straight to the task of what needs to be done. Um, I was only 18, right? I'm not the most naturally empathetic person in the world. Um, But I was like, dad, you maybe want to pause and check on your wife uh, before we just get on with the mission at hand? Like, maybe? Um, Now, that's an extreme example, right? But the root of that, which is prioritizing tasks over people, that is very common. We just blow right past whatever is going on with you personally to talk about what needs to be done, right? Doing the job right, doing it on time, way more important than the person who is doing it. Or similarly, maybe I disregard your feelings when trying to prove a point, right? If something's true, it doesn't matter how it makes you feel. I'm going to give you my thoughts, and I'm not even going to consider how my presentation of those thoughts might affect you, right? Your personal issues, irrelevant. If you're upset, that's your problem. Don't have time for the silly emotion stuff. I've seen that kind of thing at Bridges, right? And apparently, for about a third of you, you've experienced something like that here. It appears to be pretty prevalent in this area. 
Don't know why, right? Maybe it's because there's so many brilliant task-oriented problem solvers here, right? Maybe. I don't know. Um, but any time that we're sidelining how others feel in order to accomplish something or in order to prove something, then we're not giving them the attention and empathy that we are commanded to give them. Um, empathy and attentiveness are part of loving one another. And when we fail to do them, it's sin. Um, I wish we could talk about all of the 50-something one another's during our, uh, during our few weeks of this sermon series. And if we gave a completely thorough exposition of love one another, that's exactly what we would do. Um, but we're not going to have a 54-week sermon series, okay? So uh, in lieu of that, I would encourage you to look through the sermon questions, um, this week and every week, right? You can find those on bridges.info. Even if your life group doesn't use those sermon questions, you, you should look at them um, and dig into, and in addition to the sermon questions, like look at other ways that we are commanded to love one another by meeting each other's relational needs, right? You'll see things like accept one another or comfort one another. Um, and you can, you can Google what are the one another's and find a whole list, okay? Um, but we should be asking each other, how can we really practice these? Should be doing that every week and then really implementing them. We'll be, uh, we'll be trying to roll this out in our life groups too as we start having life group leader meetings again, trying to put all of this into the structure of our life groups like we did with our young adults at one time. But for our time this morning, let's close it by looking at the basis for our one anothering. The basis for our one anothering is Jesus' love for us. Jesus says, John 13, 34, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. As I have loved you. Now what? Now that I've loved you, now what? Love one another. All the one another commands are predicated on Jesus' love for us. Like if you look up, accept one another or comfort one another one another. If you look up those verses, just for instance, Romans 15, 7, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. 2 Corinthians 1, 4, we comfort one another with the comfort that we have received from God. All the one another's, they're an extension of how Jesus has loved us. We love because he first loved us. We are not one anothering in order to earn something from God. We are not one anothering really because others deserve it necessarily because we still need to one another them even if they aren't being super lovable, right? We one another not to earn something, not because others deserve it, but we one another because Jesus first one anothered us. When we weren't worthy, when we didn't deserve acceptance, Christ bore our burdens. He carried our sin. He entered our world. He, he greeted us, so to speak. He came to where we are. And he did more than simply empathize with us. He substituted himself. Right? He suffered with us, yes. Like when one part suffers, all suffer, yes. Um, so he empathized with us, yes. But more than that, he suffered in our place. On the cross, he took the curse that we deserve for our sin and freed us from condemnation forever. And he looks at us, and he says, as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus who gave us such a tangible example of what it means to love how to support and encourage and live a life uh, prioritizing others over self, Lord. I pray that we would, <laughs> that we would be <sighs> deeply welcoming, um, warmly affectionate of uh, everyone here. I pray that we offer our empathy and our attention and our encouragement and our thanks. I pray that, that this church and all churches, Lord, I pray they be known as a place to be built up and encouraged and not a place where uh, condemnation or judgment or criticism reign. Lord, help us be such a place. Uh, we pray those things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, we will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him can have eternal life. And if you have questions, spiritual questions about who is God and what, is, what does it mean to have eternal life, what does it mean to follow Jesus, we'd love to know about that. We're just so glad that you're here. God so loved the world, even Dodgers fans. If you're here today and you're a Dodger fan, we want to pray for you. We have a special recovery program and all of those things. God... Seriously, God so loved the world, and uh, we are just grateful that all of us are here, regardless of who you are and what's going on in your world. We really would sincerely love to pray for you and love to be of encouragement and help in whatever way that we can. We hope that you felt connected in some way today, whether it's your first time or you've been here many, many times before. If you go to bridges.info, you're going to find all of your next steps right there, bridges.info, bridges.info. If you go there, you're going to find a great way to interact with Pastor Dan. If you want to submit 
one or more questions based on today's message, or it could just be about anything, anything connected to Christianity, about the Bible, or anything connected to today's message. You can submit a question there at bridges.info. You can also give securely online. Your tithes and your offerings are appreciated. It continues to not only pay the bills, but to keep ministry flowing so that we can support people like the lackeys that we heard from earlier, and I'm, I'm just loving uh, connecting with our missionaries, and you're going to get to hear from some of them in the coming weeks. We've got a great event coming up here in a couple weeks for Family Fun Night. I'll tell you more about We've got a great event in November, Feed My Starving Children, November 19th and 20. You're going to hear more about that. All of those things, your tithes and your offerings, help further the ministry of Bridges Community Church. If you don't want to give online, that's okay. You can give a physical check or cash, and uh, Al Louie, I believe, will be in the back, ready to receive offerings, and you can, though, give online at bridges.info, bridges.info. You can also find service opportunities and ways to connect with Bridges Community Church. One of the service opportunities, if you go there right now, bridges.info, you're going to find all the things you need to know about Family Fun Night. Can we give it up for Family Fun Night here tonight? Yeah. <laughs> October the 29th. Okay, like, can we talk about this here for a moment? Because I, every year I get up here with a mic in my hands, and I plead with you and I try to encourage you and fire you up as much as possible. October the 29th is our annual family fun night. And even though last year we were in the midst of COVID, COVID didn't stop family fun night. We just pivoted. We just adapted. We're going to do the same thing this year. It's going to be a drive through event October the 29th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. And we have two ways that we measure the success of this event. I tell you this every single year, and I'm going to tell you once again, the first way that this becomes a successful event is 100% participation from the body at Bridges Community Church. You're like, well, what does that mean? You might be like, okay, I can't physically be there that night, but you can buy candy, and we use candy, and you can drop that off in the lobby whenever you come here next Sunday or sometime during the course of the week. You can uh, see if the church office is open. Like, we want to receive this candy so that we can then use it to share at the event. That's one way to get involved. We are decorating cars. Uh, I have been told by my wife what we are going dressed as. Many of you have questions about each year what I'm going as, and you're just going to have to wait to find out. I didn't have a choice. I was told specifically what our family is going as. Just know that my granddaughter, my little infant granddaughter, is involved somehow, some way. So, yeah, so you need to be there as a part of that. Um, yeah, we'll see how that whole thing goes. But October the 29th, we need 100% involvement. You can pray. You can give financially towards the event. You can donate candy. We need people decorating their cars. We need people helping up with setup. We need people helping out with teardown. We need people helping with parking. There's so many ways that you can help. And you're like, okay, I'd like to help. You can come talk to me. We'll get you connected. Or go to bridges.info. There's a link right there that will take you to the larger sort of list of service needs. So the first thing, 100% involvement. This is, we are all in on this. Yeah? We are all in. There's a 0% unemployment rate that evening. We are all involved. Second way that we measure success of this event, 100% invitation. We don't, we don't really spend money putting this out and, you know, buying articles here and there. Like, we could do that. We spend all of our time encouraging you to encourage others to come. And to come that night, they'll drive through. They're going to have a blast. This event is not for us. This event is for our community. We are here to serve the community. We're here to give them a wonderful night, to show the love of Jesus through our countenance. Last year, I wasn't even sure exactly what was going to happen. We had the right amount of cars, and it was just nonstop for three hours. We anticipate that again. We're working with our local police department to make sure everybody's safe. October the 29th, 530 to 830, 100% involvement, 100% invitation. We want everybody to be a part of it. Bring the candy, sign up, help, invite. Everybody is involved. All hands on deck. Other great things happening here in the life of the church. If you have a need that you would like prayer for, I'll be down here in the front after. Come up to me and we can pray and just um, talk about that. Pray about whatever it is that's on your heart. If you have a need, please don't leave here today with that need going unprayed for. Okay? We want to pray. We want to encourage you. Maybe you have questions about other things going on in the life of the church. Come talk to me, Pastor Nate, Pastor Dan, one of our other staff that are here. I just hope, again, that you are encouraged. Let's love the world as God has loved us. Let's one another, one another, 
as Jesus has demonstrated through, like we are to forgive as we've been forgiven. We're to give as God has given to us. So there are opportunities all around us to show compassion and love all around us. So I'm going to close this in a word of prayer, and then we're going to go out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done here today. We pray that we would be transformed from the inside out, that the love of Jesus would be evident in us. Thank you that you didn't just talk about love or give a seminar on love or preach a sermon on love. You sent your son. Your son came, he lived, he died. He paid the penalty for our sins. He rose again. He did all of this because God so loved the world. Thank you that Jesus did not come to condemn the world and to wag his finger in front of people's face. Thank you that he came to demonstrate tangible love. And we thank you, God, that the word was made flesh and lived among us. We, Lord, have witnessed his grace and his mercy and his love, and we are changed because of that. May we be changed people as we leave here today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. God's people said, amen. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.